seen him on television, but he's also the co-founder of Al Jazeera in English, or as the shark says, the founder of TV station Al Qaeda. That was not completely right, but he is here. He's Riz Khan, and he's very welcome back to Syme. <laughs> hey, Riz, very welcome yeah. back. Very welcome back. Hi. Grab a seat on the sofa. Yeah. Uh, the next speaker is no stranger to Syme. Uh, either. He's been here several times and we've done a lot of interesting work together. It's Jan Helene, the chief editor of Aftonbladet, our largest newspaper and also our biggest digital powerhouse. So Jan Helene, please come up on stage. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, have a seat and I'll, I'll just stand here and hang in the bar. Uh, so, so there's so many things I want to ask you guys. So if I'm rambling, you're being good journalists, just stop me and make me, you know, come to the point. But I'll, I'll start with, with storytelling. There was a lot of wonderful storytelling here <coughs> from Spencer. But how do, you think, how do you think storytelling plays into the world that, we are, that we're describing here with more channels and more people and more, more ways of interacting? I think one of the key things is the technology is spreading stories in different ways. And even from when I first started at the BBC, uh, like 25 years ago, when we used film, and we were just converting to video. Uh, we're now onto flash drives, DSLRs. It's, it's a completely different way to record the material and to distribute it. Satellites have, have given way to the internet. Uh, it's, it's a totally different way to, to get it out there, to a much bigger audience. I think one, one more thing you see is also, it's very true, there is a tons or millions of different ways of spreading stories these days. One of maybe the only comforting thing in, in the media business today is you still need a good story. Yeah. But you what is a good, a good story? story. A, a good story is actually the same, I think, today as it was you know, in the beginning of times. Once upon a time, there were. You know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's one good story, and then there is new stories. What's happening is uh, uh, with all this, you know, there can be 3D printers and floating screens and whatever, you still need a good story. Uh, and I think. Um, at least from a journalistic point of view, you need to keep focus on that. Uh, because uh, nowadays you can, you can invite the audience, you can do a, a, a lot of different uh, things. But basically, none of that has really came up with something really interesting. The most yeah. interesting yeah. I think we see now is, is uh, companies that aggregate uh, a lot of yeah. stories and, yeah. and do, yeah. does something on, it on their own. But you can see a very big trend now, I believe. Take Huffington Post, for instance, the most mm -hmm. obvious example. Uh, they were very good at aggregating and then commentating. Today, they are one of the most powerful newsrooms in America, mm -hmm. and they are originating stories again, telling them, you know. But what are stories? Are stories found or are they created? Both. Yeah, exactly. It's a bit of both, really. And it's interesting because, uh, again, the, the world has become so much smaller in access to people, uh, and the words of you know leading figures get get spread out in in milliseconds, basically uh, across uh, across the airwaves and the internet and so on. Uh, last year, I remember I told you about uh, Desmond Tutu uh, being on my show, and when I I'd sort of uh, heard the most diplomatic statement he'd ever said, uh, he said, "Thank God I am not God, otherwise I would have to say Osama bin Laden and George Bush are both my children." <laughs> so I said, that's, "That's very good." Well, I bumped into him a couple of weeks ago in New York <laughs> at the UN, and he was in an elevator, so he couldn't run away. So I reminded him uh, of of this story. And then I actually asked him, did, did, is it true that when you did this interview, and I think I mentioned this last year too, that you did an interview around the time of his 50th wedding anniversary, um, the, the journalist asked him, uh, you've been married 50 years, very long time, have you ever contemplated divorce in all that time? And he said, divorce, never, but murder. So, um, <laughs> so I reminded him of this too, and, his, and you know, he now realizes his words have stuck, they've gone out to the world. And he, <laughs> but his wife, his wife this is a there. brilliant example. Riz Khan, you're a very good storyteller, okay? What can we <laughs> do you. with this story? Come on, what can we do? We can, you know, we can dig in on it, we can comment it, and we can right, do a lot. But right. basically, that's a very good story. Thank and you. But, but <laughs> a lot of, <laughs> lot of, lot of <laughs> companies and one of the authors, uh, uh, I, I'm reading right now Heavy Metal Management because I had to because the author is going to be on stage, but I'm completely fascinated by it. So that's something you should read. Heavy Metal Management. And one of the things he says that companies need to be epic. Yeah. Uh, they need to be not just a storyteller, they need to be epic. They need to have a reason for you to care about them that goes beyond the product. It needs to be a story around it. Yeah. How do you see, I mean, you're storytellers, how do you look upon that, sort of corporates and storytelling? Well, I think it's, uh, I used to, if, you, if you're 
uh, responsible for leading a media company at this age, you better have a story. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, there is, I think, maybe the most important management you can do it now is to tell a story how you should transform this this business. You need to you know, get your organizations to be a part of that. So and internally you need to be a storyteller as well? You need to be a storyteller, absolutely. And you can, I mean, take the New York Times, for instance. They, they created a whole new desk to tell the story about themselves, yeah. uh, you know, taking New York Times into the future. And I think this is very important to, to uh, that's always important in storytelling, to, to get the, the bigger picture. One thing that's changed the, the dynamic, though, is the need to have um, celebrity and sort of reality featuring into it. So, you know, perhaps uh, 25, 30 years ago, the CEOs weren't such big figures. Now you need kind of a figurehead. You need someone who's media savvy. You need someone who's, who can tell the story too. So it's not just about the story, but it, it's who's delivering it as well. And that kind of is, it can raise the confidence or destroy it of a company. But, but who, it's getting much more transparent. So, so brands are now uh, facing completely different sets of conversations with a lot of different uh, people and organizations they wouldn't speak to before. Uh, for instance, I was invited by a large oil company, and they said, we have to t discuss about internet. And I couldn't sort of piece it together. What is a large oil company going to do with the internet? Yeah. Don't they you guys said, pump oil? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This <laughs> was like, okay, do you measure it online, or what, what's yeah. going to happen? Uh, their problem was that every time they went into a deal, they had a social media uh, sort of storm of everything that happened in their last deal, and their counterpart knew everything about the okay. deal parameters, and there were a lot of peer groups thinking, why the hell are you going to pump oil here? And there was completely a new set of, of, of realities. So their conclusion is they need to be more honest, they need to be more contributing to the community where they are, they need to build a completely different set of values into the deal-making process. Yeah. Uh, so so I, I'd like you to elaborate on that. Do we become more honest as journalists, as companies, maybe as individuals, because of transparency, or how is that going to play out? I think, I think uh, you have to. And, uh, for if you're an oil company, I guess that's a big problem. Uh, if you're a media company, this is a big opportunity uh, because uh, the transparency really uh, strengthens the journalism. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, connecting to what Riz Khan just said, I think it's more and more important to have journalists that build their own audiences. Uh, we have, you know, we, I have now reporters that have 110,000 followers on, on Twitter. Mm, yeah. And of course, that's extremely powerful. You know, yeah. if, if our editor says, ah, your story is not that good, not that good, I show you. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, you yeah. tell it to their audience. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's one way of playing this uh, transparency. But do you trust and Riz Khan then, or do you trust Al Jazeera, or do you trust... Yeah. You need to trust both, and yeah. it's very hard to yeah. tell the difference between Riz Khan and, yeah. and Al Jazeera. We tend to represent our corporations a lot more as a result, and that's the key thing. It's, uh, and it's funny because news organizations struggle with this, uh, you know, are our people becoming bigger than the organization? There's yeah. something that certainly British culture has struggled with, you know, the news is the star is how they always put it, and they've never really promoted the people that much, whereas in America, it's we've got the star, you know. Uh, the irony is that there's no escaping it. People watch people, you know. People, I, I, I do this test with news editors and with people in general. I say, name a, name a show uh, on CNN or on the BBC, apart from Click, of course. Um, or, you know, they, usually they struggle. They usually, if I say, but name people, they can name the people. Oh, yeah, we've got Larry King, we've got Christian Amanpour, we've got, you know, they can yeah. name, you know, Tim Sebastian, Stephen Sacker, Spencer Kelly. Um, so it's, it's the people that are the vehicle, and that's where the, the fight comes in the industry, too. Yeah, and the brand becomes more of a meeting place. You know, this is where right. these people gather and tell their stories, and of course, all stories uh, becomes better of, of good editing. Uh, but this editing also becomes transparent, so I think that's the role of a media brand. Uh, is to collect these good uh, stars who are good at telling stories and good at finding stories. What's interesting is that, you know, the English media, English language media has dominated the globe. And it's only with Al Jazeera English coming in that you started to have a, a media center that was not based in, in America or Britain. Mm. So the, though the staff are largely Western to a large degree, there's still a different perspective. And it's coming out of Doha, for example, with Al Jazeera. Um, and I think Russia Today, France 24, all these channels, CCTV News coming up, they're going into the English language. But as we saw with technology, you know, this simultaneous translation will change the dynamic of what information people can access. And I give you the example because Al Jazeera Arabic is very different from Al Jazeera English. It targets a different audience. It's more like, uh, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but like a Fox TV version, you know, in Arabic. Uh, and plays to a different audience, more dynamic, more aggressive in some ways. So once that get, gets translate, translated into English, which is what they thought we were going to be, some people, um, it'll be different because people can then see what, what, you know, what's being said. Of course, the translation can get lost. And I gather Electrolux, one of your 
great companies here, when it translated its advertising campaign from Swedish into English for the American market, it kind of came out badly because it was, nothing sucks like an Electrolux. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know how many Americans bought Electrolux then. <laughs> but if, if you, if you uh, go to the business model of media, newspapers, even though we can hang on to them, th they're not going sort of to sell more advertising and more copies next year, probably. Uh, let's, let's have that as an assumption for the discussion. Uh, what, what, what is going to happen with that? And I met, met uh, Miguel Forbes from the Forbes family, and they, they're starting to see Forbes as a badge of honor, and they have Forbes private banking, Forbes corporate university, Forbes buildings that are 30% more expensive just because they're called Forbes, and a lot of other things. And the, the physical magazine is just a badge of honor or nobility or something right. like that. What is that in the Aftonbladet world? How do you see that evolve? Well, it's, uh, that's very challenging. I mean, the business model in the old days were, were easy. We're quite good, uh, we're quite well off so far because we have such a large audience. Mm. So, uh, but that's basically an, an ad revenue business model. Mm. What we will see in the future is, is uh, we have to challenge ourselves and see how much new business and new models can this brand carry. Uh, we do not know that, but we will see uh, experimental and new things. Uh, around the brand uh, Aftonbladet and certainly around other media brands as yeah. well. well you brand, you brand need to, to challenge what, But what this. are the things, anything more specific, like five years down the road, will it be like an exclusive comes out every week and it's 200 crowns and it's like the best of... Or wh how do you see that at all? Or will it be all on the pad? Or That, that might be a solution for, for some. Uh, but I think also you will see a clearer dis distinction between like lifestyle journalism and uh, traditional scrutiny journalism that has, you know, you can do quite a little and it's quite important. If you, if you want to be a voice in the media world, you better have a good scrutiny, you, know, you need the scoops, you need the, uh, the stories. And that's, uh, that's quite fragile to new business models. Lifestyle journalism is not, I would say. So I, I would say you see a lot of experimenting on, in that field. I have, I have a thesis and it's that we're going towards a DJ uh, society. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're nodding here, I awake, agrees. No, uh, where if you have everything, you have all the music, everybody can make music, you need a DJ to tell you what's most relevant. And that's why Tiesto is becoming more important than the guy who came up with the tunes. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing the same thing with all these news and everything happen. Who can pick what's relevant and who can sort of shine the light on what I should care about? And that's what you're doing and it's a fascinating process. You know, every day, everything that happens in the world, we're just going to write about these things. How do, you, how, do you sort of, how do you pick what's important? Well, a brand is uh, essentially an emotion, and people will trust brands. And, of course, trust uh, can, can be lost. It can be built as well. And new brands come up, and trust is built, and, and sometimes trust is lost. So I think that's, that's a key, key factor, is that as long as these key um, outlets, often blowed it and BBC and CNN and Jazeera and so on, as long as they keep the trust going, I think they will have an audience. Uh, if something betrays that trust, or the content starts to show there's the trust has been lost, then I think you will start to see a change and people shift. But the aggregators are doing very well because they're bringing in a variety of views. You know, you can now check things against uh, other things, you know, check, check one source against another, which but, is what but we I'm, used I'm to sort do. of interested in the sort of process of picking what is relevant out of so many things happening. That's and sort of yeah. what are the drivers also behind that? That's what good editors do. Uh, yeah. They're very good at, at, at doing that. And I think you see some interesting examples now. Uh, I saw them the other day from... Uh, in, in a program that we're running now, you look at Bleach Report, for instance, a sports nation in, in, in America, for, in the sports field. They are sort of, you know, I'm getting tired of hearing it's so interesting with, you know, reader-generated content. That's always been interesting as a theory, but when you read it, it's quite boring. And, right, and you right. can never, you know, you never get a view over it. It's, it's, it's so massive. Yeah. But they are really now uh, uh, doing very interesting thing about packaging. Uh, reader-generated uh, content in a very, very good way. And they're sort of building a newsroom the other way around, from, you know, starting in, with the readers, narrowing, yeah. narrowing their, uh, the numbers of contributors down until they have like 75 very good contributors, and they are like the best reporters you can find in that field. And, and they, are, they are doing something new with this uh, that I'm very, very interested in. And I think that's one of the ways you will see uh, forward how you will yeah. create stories. And what, what do you think, what, is sort of what drives that you publish something? Is it... Uh, I don't like this one, or is it ethics, or is it responsibility to convey news, or is it mon making money, or what, what are the sort of some of the, 
publishing. Need a, you need a clear reason to be and good editors. You, you can never, you know, that Sports Nation and Bleach Report, they have very good editors and they have a clear reason to be. But perspective it's, is an important thing and I recall being a trainee at the BBC, you know, all those years ago and we, we, I went from newsroom to newsroom as part of this two-year traineeship and I was in the radio newsroom, the national radio newsroom and one night a story broke on the wires and I ran to the editor and it was, you know, 200 people killed in a ferry sinking uh, in China, off the coast of China. And I went to him, I said, oh, look, look, there's the stories come up, 200 people died in China. He says it happens every day. So his perspective was, this is not news to us, you know, that we don't want that. We're dealing with national news, which is more relevant. So perspective is a key thing when it comes to how editors choose news. Yeah. And the fact that we've become more global and more globally accountable uh, has changed the dynamic a little bit. But there is still a lemming mentality, you know, the channels monitor each other, and if CNN is watching the BBC and the BBC is watching Jazeera, and they're all like, oh, why are they running with this? And, and then everyone is under pressure to do the same story. There is a, still a bit of that. But will there be, and we've discussed that before, and it's amazing, if you look at Arabic television, there's exactly as biased as our televisions are. <laughs> I mean, I saw a Rocky movie where Rocky was a bad American, and so the, the, the Ivan Drago was a bad American, and Rocky was Mahmoud, and it was completely different. And it was hilarious to see that we are not even reflecting that we're getting the Western story on almost everything right. we're seeing. Do you think that will change with a more globalized and sort of translated and searchable, transparent web? It is will changing. that lead to less conflict? Yeah, no, well, it, I don't know about less conflict yet, but certainly it is changing that there's more awareness. I mean, I used to always say that, you know, Hollywood was the great indicator of who the bad guys are, especially James Bond, because the bad guy in James Bond is always like the bad guy of the time. You know, during the Cold War, it was the Russians, you know, and, uh, or something Eastern Bloc connected. And it went through all phases of, you know, Chinese, Korean, and, and so on, even media magnet, if you recall. Um, and then they started to hedge their bets a bit now. So it's someone who is bad, but they don't want to link it too much to a specific country or a specific uh, you know, political ideology so much. So that's changed a bit. But, but that was always the, the indicator of who is the bad guy. You know? <laughs> but again, that's, that's uh, back to transparency. You see another trend, I think, uh, yeah. which is, I mean, Al Jazeera, is, I would say, is uh, an example of that, who almost, uh, at least from certain parts, uh, were viewed as, as a part in the Arabic Spring, for instance. It yeah. was an important factor in the Arabic yeah. Spring. That's an interesting role for a media company where you traditionally would say, no, no, we're just by, we're not partisan here, we're just reporting. Yeah. And Al Jazeera had a very active role. But it took a long time to shed that brand, you know, it's like the, not just Al Qaeda, but the Death to America brand was kind of a hard one to shed. But it's taken some time, you know. Uh, and then my, my daily show, which ended last year, unfortunately, the comedian I had on talking about news and current affairs said, can I be the first to say death to America on, on Al Jazeera? <laughs> so I said, that's not going to help. But no. anyway, yeah, it's... it's but, but your audience getting less and less problems with that as long as they yeah. know the, the, this is okay, yeah, this is right. the view here. Yeah. I, I know the view, it's a transparency, I know from where he talks to me now. Yeah, that's right. And, and yeah. uh, back just five, ten years ago, we said, no, no, you can't do that, we need to be... And, and the profile of people within the, the industry have changed. I mean, when I joined, uh, well, at BBC World Service, for example, or BBC News, I was the first brown face they had mm. on, you know, uh, on mainstream news at the BBC. <laughs> And, you know, the makeup I know there artist, was some reason you got the job. Yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> I mean, they didn't have us. Hello, Dad, I'm ready. Um, but uh, actually, the makeup, the makeup department were quite smart. They kind of like blended the makeup and they managed to do it. I went to CNN and my first day in makeup there, this sort of big American makeup artist came up and said, ah, well, I don't know if we have something your color, and went and got a box of African-American makeup from one of the other guys. And I was like, how am I going to read the news first time on CNN? Hello, dear. <laughs> Welcome to the show. You know, it's so uh, it, it was funny. They had to adjust to the idea of different people on screen. But are you are you seeing that journalism is getting better and sharper? And do you see it, do you look upon it positively, or are you saying, hell, how are we going to fund good journalism? Where's this going to go? Well, uh, journalism is getting better by this. For for the first time, we have a. Uh, uh, you know, that's, as long as I've been in the business, there's been always this discussion that someone needs to scrutinize media itself. Mm -hmm. That's now being done all the time in, in social media, and that's very good. Journalism becomes stronger uh, by that. My uh, perspective is different, though, from Jan. Uh, you know, I'm, I worry because I think A, training programs have been scrapped in so many places, so people don't get uh, the training to, to filter information so well. Uh, and so young journalists are coming in a little blind. Plus, journalism, at least broadcast journalism, is aligning. Uh, when I was trained at the BBC, we never used adjectives, you know, it was, you never said, I remember a, a guy giving his script to a, an editor and it said, the long-running bloody war in Sri Lanka. And the, guys, the editor said, how many civil wars do you know that are not bloody? Take out the adjective, you know, so yeah. you don't have any kind of position. But television news is aligning now and people, you know, you, you'd never hear a broadcaster saying, I think. 
you know, it was always just facts and figures, and that's changing. So I'm actually not that optimistic it's going in the right direction. But then I'm kind of old school in that way, so. Yeah, I, I actually am, but, I, but you do have to agree that there is positive that there is a lot of debate around journalism. There is debate. That's one good thing. Yeah, and, and I just—I mean—I I wish people would invest more in, in training. You know, that's that's going to be yeah. the tough. I one. can agree so. with you that that you know uh, traditional journalism skills like uh, fact checking and beware of your source and that stuff. That's not that's not held as a very high competence in right. the social media, not at all. But, and we have to adjust that's, to change. That's the journalism yeah. But it's, it's interesting job. that the debate is going on here, because uh, little did you know, but you're going to have a Google Hangout together at 1 o'clock up right. at Google yeah. Hangout, where the discussion <laughs> continues. So I hope you can make that, both of you. Yeah. You uh, know, it's funny, though. I say that it's interesting, because we have to adjust to change, and change isn't always good. Uh, and I always, always illustrate it with the story of this old um, Italian ship, you know, hundreds of years ago where uh, the sailors, it was quite tough on those ships and the captain got all the men together. He said, okay, men, I got the good news and I got the bad news. First, the good news. After three months at sea, we're going to have our first change of underwear. And all the guys like, oh, thank God, a change of underwear. He says, now the bad news. Luigi, you change with Enrico. Enrico, <laughs> change. change isn't always a good thing. <laughs> thank you very much, gentlemen. Give it up thank for you. the honor of this. Thanks. Thank you very much.